Great. Well, Mitchell Asset News, my name is Rob, and today we've got under four hours before Cardano hits critical mass with the Basel upgrade. So we'll talk exactly what that means and what things are going on. Also, we'll take a look at a little bit of bad news as we talk about uh, how Ray Dalio believes that uh, the next couple of years are going to be truly awful. And then we'll take a look at a little Tether FUD. And I got to tell you, I think it's time for them to uh, lay out their cards on the table and see what everybody's playing with. And then lastly, I'm just going to ask you for a little bit of help. And then, of course, lastly, lastly, go with Q&A. So first things first, let's talk about it. Cardano, by the hit uh, critical mass with the uh, Basel upgrade. And this is going to happen in uh, roughly three, four hours and some, some change. And uh, I think this is going to be good. This is one of the major upgrades that they've been uh, pushing for and striving for. And uh, these are the critical mass factors that have affected it. So Cardano Basel upgrade ready, ready to hit. All three metrics necessary to launch the Basel upgrade have been met. I know some people have thought that maybe they would push it back, but it looks like they're going full steam ahead. And within the last 48 hours, 13 crypto exchanges had confirmed their re readiness for the hard fork, representing over 87% of Cardano's liquidity. That's pretty good. I don't know which other exchanges are like, nope, we're not going to support it. But I mean, they've got at least 87%. And there's one big exception, which I thought was kind of odd, is uh, Coinbase is the only exchange listed as in progress. And I thought to myself, that's very, very strange. Coinbase also, uh, if you remember, is one of the last major exchanges to list Cardano. So I don't know what the deal is there. However, a recent tweet by Coinbase has already hinted that it will support the fork, saying ADA transactions will be halted for maintenance for the Cardano Basel hard fork. Uh, so the three factors that are in place, which they would say is critical mass, is they have an updated Basel node in place. 98% of mainnet blocks are now being created by the updated nodes. And the blockchain's top dApps or decentralized applications have also confirmed their readiness, marking all three metrics needed for the upgrade go ahead. And actually even Charles Hoskinson tweeted this out and said, uh, this was nine hours ago. It says roughly, or I thought, excuse me, five hours ago, roughly nine hours to Vazel, everyone ready. And he's taking a look at uh, Pool Tool IO. And you can see that uh, in the next epic, I know some people will say, Rob, it's epoch or, or epoch, not epic. Sure, whatever. Uh, the next epic ends in about three hours. And uh, that is when the Vazel upgrade will go forward. And this one is a good one. It's going to help with uh, a little bit of transaction speed, hopefully with that, that pipelining. It's going to help for uh, different dApps to build on it and make things a little bit faster. And uh, hopefully a little bit easier because that's one of the big issues, especially with the, with the concurrency and things like that. So I'm looking forward to this and hopefully this will help out uh, the DNU stake pool. If you haven't staked, uh, link in the description, you can figure out how to do that and uh, stake with us. And the big question, though, is, is how has this affected the price of Cardano? Because remember, we just had that uh, major Ethereum merge upgrade, and uh, that was a total buy the rumor, sell the news. And today, eh, not really no different. So <laughs> it's the same thing going over and over again. Last 24 hours. Actually, let's take a look at seven days. Ugh, not even that good. Last seven days hasn't even been that great. So it was 48 cents here, 18th of September. And here we are at 45 cents. We may hit 50 cents before in the next three hours or so, but I expect the price to drop yet again because people are like, yeah, uh, the upgrade is here and that's it. And we're just here to make money and that's fine. I got nothing against that. So I believe another buy the rumor, sell the news. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And hopefully it'll lead to a little bit more adoption and dApps uh, being used. And that will take care of Cardano. But the next part here, is not that great of news. And this is uh, from Ray Dalio. And he says there's uh, three signs, some classic early signs that there's a U.S. Re recession upon us. I think it's pretty much here already, but whatever. First of all, who's Ray Dalio? Why should I be talking about him? Well, I mean, he's one of the uh, investment legends. Uh, he's an American billionaire and hedge fund manager, served as co-chief investment officer of the world's largest hedge fund, Bridgewater, since 85. And uh, in a lot of circles, especially investing circles, this guy is, is where it's at. Everybody seems to love to Ray and what he has to say. And this is no different. I always, uh, when he's talking, I, I uh, tend to uh, perk up and see what he's saying. And remember, Ray's a smart guy. He at one point thought uh, Bitcoin was trash and there was nothing really to it. Then he changed his stance and he said, you know, every, every investment fund should have, you know, an allocation between one and 3%, I think he said. A low percentage, but I think deep down he knows that people should probably get a little more to it. So this is what he says. He goes, look, there's some key red flags here. Namely, 
the drawdowns and cash balances that, that have been built up earlier, the contraction of both the housing and, and automotive sectors, as well as a rise in credit, credit delinquency rates. And uh, he's pretty spot on on some of those things. But if you take a look at uh, the FRED, the Federal Fed Reserve uh, out of St. Louis, they put together a report for all the delinquencies, uh, rates for all the banks. And we're actually reading from uh, right to left, not left to right, because it goes here, it says Q2 2021, Q1 2022, Q2 2022. So I actually, no, I, I take that back. It's Q1 2022 and Q2, and then it jumps back over here. God knows, I don't know why they did that, but whatever. So here's what we got. In Q1 for real estate loans, the delinquency percentage is 1.43. Then it increased to Q2 2021 to 1.65. And now it's at 1.29. So that's a reduction. And if you can take a look at here from like Q2 2021, 2.48 to 1.96, a little bit down as well. 0.94 is what So everything from like the real estate loans so far are doing pretty good. But what he's talking about is credit cards, credits. And I think that's a big issue that's going to come up later on because people, there is a demand for workers. I don't know how, what people are actually paying out there, but I know that there's a lot of issues with the job market itself. So what do people do? Well, there's no stimmy checks coming out and they still are, are spending like crazy. What do they do? They put it on credit cards. And what happens then? Then there's a, there's, then there's a default and that's just a downward spiral. So at 1.57 to 1.81, people are starting to default. 1.4 to 1.72 or other. And then 1.23 to leases, that's eh, going down. Commercial industrial loans, a little bit down. Agricultural loans, down. Total loans. Across the board, it's looking pretty good except for the credit card loans. So just pay attention to that little piece right there. I think uh, as retail investors and retail uh, spenders, they're going to start to put more on credit cards. And then, of course, the rates just go up. And also, if you take a look at the mortgage delinquency rates from 2000 to the first quarter of 2022, so January, February, March, you can see that, you know, it's the, it, we peaked at around 2009, 2010, 9.3% delinquency rates. Remember those days? I do. It was awful. Uh, but now, We've gone pretty steadfast down since 2020 after coronavirus, and we're right here. Could they have gone up? Yeah, but I don't think they're, they're much above what's going on here. However, with Jerome Powell coming out and saying, hey, you know what? We're going to raise things 75 basis points, which I agree he should have done. I know it's a very unpopular opinion, but that's just what I think. I think he's got to get a hold of inflation, and if he doesn't, we've got a lot more problems are on the horizon. So I was hoping he would have done 100 basis points. Yeah, that's true. I said it. But with all that going on behind the scenes, there's a bigger issue, which is people can't afford houses. This is from Danny. Otto Strauss, he says, if you secured a 30-year fixed mortgage on a $600,000 home at 2.6% interest in 2021, oh, those are great days. You have the same monthly mortgage payment as someone that bought a house for $392,000. So $200,000 less at a 6.2% interest rate, and you're paying the exact same. Over 30 years, you are paying hundreds of thousands more dollars into that mortgage, and that is the big catastrophe. So hopefully, as time goes on, we can see the rates go down and people can refinance, but I see a lot of problems in, in, the, in the housing market moving forward. But I will say this. The bright side to this story is um, I always thought it was going to be like this. I always thought we were going to go this route. If you've been watching the channel for any length of time, you know I'm not a very bullish person until there's something to be bullish about. And I just have it in my mind that uh, the next two, three years are going to suck. And because of that, I mean, whether the four-year cycles play out or not, again, I don't know. But even if they don't, let's say I have to dollar cost average for three years or four years, I don't know. In the end, time in the market is better than timing the market. And I'm just waiting for my time. That's all it is. So remember, 2012, having all-time high dip resets. 2016 through 19, having all-time high dip resets. 2020, 2023, we just had a halving. Hit an all-time high of 67,000, which was pretty weak in my opinion. And then we're now in this dip, and then I think there's even more pain to come in 2023, like Ray Dalio just talked about. 2024 is still going to suck, but at least we're going to have a halving lead us into 2025, maybe 2026. So the question I have is, is it so awful if we get to dollar cost average 
and purchase crypto for another couple of years at super low rates to see it spike up yet again. I'm not saying it is, not financial advice, not your dad, but I'm just saying I can wait for three years. And uh, the bigger question then is, well, if we talk so much about buying, Rob, then when are we gonna sell? It's a great question. And it's something that I have been lacking severely on this channel. So this weekend on Saturday, I put together a, a real, relatively comprehensive video about taking profits. I think just as much as people bark about dollar cost averaging and diamond hands and all that stuff, they need to, well, I can't tell what, I'm, I can't tell them what to do, but on this channel, I'm gonna to start to focus more on, hey, get ready for some profit taking. Here's what I'm gonna do, here's when I'm gonna do it, here's the factors that I'm looking at and move forward because you can't just diamond hands forever. Some people can, it's just not my game. And uh, if that's you, uh, God bless you, good for you. But for me, along the way, I'm probably gonna take some profits and I'll tell you exactly how that works out on a video which will be out on Saturday. So let me just think about that in the comments and then let's finish up with a little FUD, kinda. So yesterday we had talked about the government coming down on stable coins and they wanna see everything backed by stable coins, not an algorithmic backed stable coin like Luna or Terra or whatever that failure was. And I know some people in the comment section, but Rob, you don't, you don't understand uh, um, algorithmically backed stable coins. You're right, I obviously don't. But uh, I can tell you this, uh, Do Kwan tried that the first time, failed. Gave him a second run, failed again. Maybe the third time's a charm, but it's not gonna be with my money. So what I'm looking for is who is backed by what. And this article kind of spells it, spells it out. So. New York judge demands Tether to prove USDT backing, or Tether. Uh, Tether was slapped with a lawsuit uh, for issuing USDT in order to pump the price of Bitcoin. And this has been going on for a couple of years, if uh, anybody's unfamiliar. This market manipulation lawsuit has been going on for quite some time and has taken another turn. US judge in New York dismissed Tether's motion that blocked the release of its financial records. What they were trying to do is say, look, you don't need our financial records. We'll give you everything else. Just we're not gonna give you that. And the judge is like, no, you're gonna show us. Then that's how it goes. Therefore, the network now has to produce an array of documents pertaining to the backing of USDT. This list includes ledgers, balance sheets, income statements, cash flow, and profit and loss, P&Ls. The stable coin firm has to present records of any transfers of crypto or other stable coins. Minor details like the time of the transactions were also demanded. And uh, this is from uh, the judge. The documents sought in the transactions RFPs appear to go to one of the plaintiff's core allegations that the defendants, Tether, engaged in crypto commodities transaction using unbacked USDT and that those transactions were strategically timed to inflate the market. And then it goes over some other stuff and gets boring. But here's my question. Does anybody have a problem with Tether producing these documents? Look, they've already been audited, we know. Uh, there was a British Virgin Islands, I believe, uh, auditing company that said everything's in the up and up and it was good, great. So do they get a pass just to get one and done and that's it, and then we're good to go? Like, I'm just saying. I just think that uh, if we're gonna put this much money into it, let's just uh, put our cards on the table. Look, USDC does it. Binance coin does it. You know, Binance, Binance coin, or not BNB, but the uh, stable coin itself is backed 100% by cash reserves and other assets that can equal up to the amount that they have. So, I mean, if they're doing that and they're proving that, why not Tether? And I'm not, I'm not telling you that Tether is, <laughs> is about to explode as something that's happening. I'm just saying that, why not? I mean, if you can produce it, produce it, and everybody can just say, well, that's cool, great. Now we can use Tether and, and there's no FUD and we can just get past this. None of this dancing around the stuff. Just go from there. I don't see the problem. But maybe I'm uh, misguided. Let me know where I'm uh, wrong there. And uh, lastly, I'm just going to ask for everybody for just a little bit of help. Uh, as Puerto Rico, of course, we know that uh, Hurricane Fiona just came through. Look at that. Just roofs and everything being in shambles and just awful. Uh, this is from uh, a great video from 50, 50 Shades of Way. You got to love Twitter. And this is what it looked like as all the devastation was coming through. So if you would be so kind, uh, I would appreciate it to uh, help out. There's two ways you can do it. There's a link in the description. First of all, uh, there is this 
Look at that. Jeez, that's awful. Electricity is still down for most of the island. World Central Kitchen. Who is this? Founded by uh, Chef Jose Andres in 2010. Where there's a fight so that hungry people can eat, we'll be there. And here's their uh, website itself. You can support it. And just so you know, it's not a scam. There's this website called charitywatch.org. I give them an A plus and it's very rare to see those types of things. You can see like some organizations, it takes like 50 bucks to raise 60 bucks. This one takes just a buck to raise hundred dollars. So they're pretty efficient in what they do and they're trying to feed people in there. Also, would you see those rooftops going crazy? Well, it's getting ripped off. Protechos is the one that I donate to. I just gave them $5,000 recently. Probably give them another 5,000 pretty soon. And they are a nonprofit organization. They're located in Puerto Rico. And everybody who donates uh, will be matched by Ateache, uh, Anvila, whatever it's called in Puerto Rico. Correct me in the comment section, but uh, they get their funds matched. So within the next uh, week or so, if you could do, be so kind. And you can also donate in crypto. Uh, all it does is it uh, attaches to your uh, MetaMask wallet and you can send over. Look, if I got a thousand people watching me, how about 10 bucks of USDC? That's all I'm asking for. Just 10 bucks. Then we go from there. And that's it. That's all. Links in the description right there. El Puerto Rico. That's all I got. So look, uh, that concludes today for the news. If you want to stick around, we'll go over the q and I'll answer all your questions the best of my abilities. I also want to talk about uh, a Voyager update and that 50 million. I think that was wrong. But we'll go over that in the Q&A. So if you got to take off, take off. Uh, thanks for coming by. If not, stick around. We'll do a little Q&A. Also, before you go, like and subscribe. I like this stuff. And Q&A.